this uh, high-level panel, um, I'd like to welcome you all to, and again, thanks to the organizers and the Latvian presidency, of course, and the EU. We have a high-level panel which will look at what really is the way forward for the e Eastern Partnership, how civil society can be a partner in that, um, both invited to the table and, of course, bringing added value expertise. Since Vilnius two years ago, obviously a great deal has happened, um, obviously from the negative side of the annexation of Crimea and the war in eastern Ukraine, but positive developments, visa-free travel for Moldova, association agreements for Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Uh, moving forward, there will be, there already is now a review process of the of the par Eastern Partnership and the neighborhood policy. Inevitably, with the association agreements in place, we'll see more differentiation, but I know there's debates about more, more for more versus more back to basics approach. Um, but I think also, is there the vision there for the EU and the partner countries to move forward and address new challenges, particularly internal and external challenges which face the partner countries? So our panel will be able to give us their ideas on the vision, the road forward. Um, obviously, those challenges include energy integration, um, rule of law and human rights, which is always a challenge in the balance between the EU working with governments, but also addressing fundamental values, for instance, political prisoners. Um, the enlargement perspective, Donald Tusk said ahead of the summit, that of course, that. Uh, the accession, the, the, sorry, the association agreement signatory countries certainly should have the right to a European dream. Uh, in real politique, it's not on the table at the moment. But what are the modalities to, ex if you look at two of the big issues facing the region now, I think the challenge of the media, uh, the information war, and yesterday we had the first Eastern Partnership Media Freedom Conference, and I think there's the promise that we'll see a lot more in that area. And I think that and another big area, security, is one perhaps where the Eastern Partnership format itself is not sufficient. Uh, the member states, NATO members, uh, clearly can in different ways contribute. And that perhaps is true in a lot of the Eastern Partnership on the rule of law, on institution building. From the, the side of civil society, of course, there are inputs, and I hope there will be inputs into the review process. One from the Civil Society Forum has been the uh, Eastern Partnership European Integration Index, and I have a copy here, which I would like to give to Commissioner Hahn as a Civil Society Forum submission towards the review process. That, of course, gauges the progress of the different Eastern Partnership countries, and it rather reflects the association agreement in terms of which three uh, are performing best, but it also looks sector by sector at the challenges where progress is too slow, where more is needed. Uh, and of course, I think it's very important now that civil society shows that it can monitor, it can be a, a valuable player at the table. We have the civil society platforms in the association agreements, which are, are currently being uh, put together. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of challenges, and we have really excellent lineup here today. We have Commissioner Johannes Hahn for Enlargement Negotiations and European Neighborhood Policy. We have uh, Foreign Minister of Latvia, Mr. Edgars uh, Rinkovic. Uh, we have um, David uh, Bakradze, State Minister of Georgia on European and Euro-Atlantic integration, and Richard Giragosian of the Regional Studies Center in Armenia. So I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner Hahn uh, to tell us first his ideas on, on the way forward, the process, the review, and I hope also how you see civil society interacting as both a, a player and a contributor, and I hope with a voice at the table as we have successfully had through the, the different platforms over the past years. Commissioner. First of all, thank you very much and uh, welcome to all of you. And if I'm looking in the, in the audience, I can see already some uh, 
colleagues uh, which I have met in, in the course of my visits in the um, individual countries. First of all, I would like to thank uh, in particular the Latvian presidency uh, represented and uh, steered by the foreign minister for these uh, so-called uh, side events of the Riga summit, which I would like to which I would prefer to call main events, uh, not side events, because uh, to, uh, to have an event for the media, for the civil society, and for the business community clearly indicates and marks what are the cornerstones of um, a societal development and on what uh, we have to focus. Uh, because these three uh, elements, uh, these three parts of a society, which are clearly interlinked, are crucial for the development of a free, open, independent, um, transparent society. And that's why I'm uh, so happy that you had the idea and uh, to organize these events, because this is clearly important and uh, can show and demonstrate where the focus of, of our activities must be and will be in the next couple of years. And uh, in that respect, once again, thank you very much. I think. Uh, uh, civil society uh, organizations are <clears throat> extremely important. Uh, of course, if I'm looking into the uh, partner countries, there is a different level of, uh, so to say, development, of uh, uh, even of uh, freedom, etc. This has to be addressed. I think also here in a tailor-made approach from our side, I think it's, it's great that today I have uh, learned that around 300 stakeholders are present. Uh, I think this is already a strong message back to your countries. Uh, clearly shows how lively this scene is. But uh, I think it's also important that uh, we improve our work. Uh, uh, we use such conferences, such events, also for networking, for exchanging views. My intention in the next couple of years is to offer something more on an institutional basis, uh, to give uh, civil society organizations a platform in Europe where they can meet each other, where they can exchange their experiences, share their experiences. May I say it's not only for Eastern Europe, it's also for the southern neighborhood of the European Union where it is really decisive to have a strong civil society. So civil society is so to say, the nucleus of a democratic uh, structure, and that's why the efforts of the European Union uh, will not only stay, will, will in, uh, also in terms of financial contributions increase. Uh, if I'm looking, and I don't know if all of you have seen <coughs> this little leaflet about um, also the financial development over the past, uh, uh, dec not decades, but uh, financial perspectives, it was nearly always uh, doubled. Uh, we started uh, with 30 million, and in the previous period from 2007 to 2013, it was uh, nearly 70 million uh, um, uh, euro we have uh, provided for our civil society organizations in the eastern neighborhood. And in the new financial perspective, it will be around 150. Um, don't expect that uh, uh, in to, uh, 2020 upwards, it will be 300. But I think important is the message that uh, investment in civil society is uh, important, is decisive, and uh, but I have to say not everything is about money. It's about determination. It's about readiness, willingness. Uh, I have seen, as I have said, several um, um, structures of civil society engagement in the different countries. Uh, it's important to have a huge variety of civil society organizations. Uh, but may I also ask, uh, wherever it is possible and necessary, and it is definitely everywhere necessary, I really urge you also to participate in the, polit uh, in the, in the uh, policy, not only in the policy shaping, but also in the policy decision-making process. So at a certain moment, some representatives of civil society should move into politics in one or the other way. I think it would be a mistake to say we are civil society and politics is something different. No, I think it's about a certain kind of uh, 
flexibility, of exchange, of move, uh, of inspiration, of uh, uh, inclusion, of participation. I think this is also something you have to have in mind as one of your next steps in some um, countries. It happened already. If I take Ukraine, I think this is a good example. Indeed, it's a challenge. Now you can see some members of the RADA, having been very prominent member of the civil society uh, um, uh, structure, they are now there. Now they have to deliver. I, believe me, as a, in many uh, dimensions of the word old politician, uh, not in all, hopefully, um, it, it is a challenge to deliver in public life. It's easy to demand something, but it's more challenging to deliver, to find and to strike a compromise. Edgar is just testing it out. To, to, he, he is negotiating the declaration for the summit. <laughs> this is probably um, the championship, uh, what you can do in your political life. But uh, this is definitely um, uh, something which I believe is important, and this is um, something I would like to urge you to step into political life, either in existing parties, founding new ones, whatsoever. Decisive is to move gradually also in the political arena, but of course, a lively uh, civil society structure is essential and should stay in the future. Uh, I also, and this would be my, my final comment, um, wherever you have the feeling, please reconnect you to similar organizations in other countries across the borders. It's more than ever important to have this international, this cross-border approach, not to stay only within your own constituency. It's about uh, sharing experiences, uh, having an exchange, having a better understanding how others are thinking. Some still remaining problems, even in the European Union, is that uh, we don't know each other and uh, we don't know what are the historical cultural backgrounds of our partners, of our friends, of our so-called family members. And in that respect, um, um, international relationships are very important, but uh, probably it's, it's, it's the wrong uh, in that respect, audience, but as it is web streams, maybe it, uh, it uh, reaches some others. Those who are here have already done it. But uh, once again, more can always be done. And therefore, once again, I think an increased investment also in financial terms uh, in civil society is one of the best investments European Union can do. Thank you very much. I think the, the call for civil society to, to, to be active and even engaged in politics is certainly um, reflected in a number of the partner countries. Certainly we've seen that, I think, twice in, in Georgia, and we'll hear from uh, the Georgian uh, government in a minute. But first, um, to our host, um, Foreign Affairs Minister of, of Latvia. I believe it's on, yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to all of you for coming and participating in this second civil society forum in Riga. The first one we had in Vilnius, I think, was a very good intent, uh, in, intended, and also we had a very good discussion already there. So it was also very good stimulus for us to organize the second one. And I hope that now, as Johannes has said, this uh, main event and I really agree that we should call all events that are also uh, a satellite events of the heads of state and government meeting are not side events, but main events. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Johannes, also for your personal engagement and engagement of the commission in, in and also uh, working on, 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 on this uh, very important forum. Uh, I have to say that, uh, to some extent, uh, all summits remind me a little bit of marathon. You have quite a long run, then you have last meters, and then you reach the finish. But I also can reassure you that there is going to be the life after Riga as well, for all, for Eastern Partnership, for civil society. And if we speak about uh, the current state of play, 
and how we could actually proceed from Riga uh, onwards, I think that some of decisions that will be reflected in Riga declaration will be of benefit to societies of all Eastern partner nations. Also, some of events we are having here should become also the tradition. For instance, uh, also in parallel with this event, we are having also the first media freedom conference. And we all know that uh, civil society, efficient state cannot function without free media, which sometimes and very often criticizes the government for what's not right, uh, for also working on the proper reflection of the public opinion. Uh, first, deliverable from Riga, what I believe is going to really affect uh, many of you, also many of uh, people living in all partner nations, but particularly in Georgia and Ukraine, is going to be a very clear commitment by the EU uh, if all the benchmarks are met by the end of the year to introduce visa <coughs> liberalization next year. That's something that we have been already putting in the uh, declaration. There are some things to be done, but still I believe that uh, this really be, will be helpful tool for also more public diplomacy, more interaction between people of Ukraine and Georgia and European Union. I'm also happy to see that we will be moving with visa facilitation with Belarus, which I think also is very important thing. And also we will be reviewing visa liberalization and mobility issues with other uh, partners. So I think that this is something that in a long term, the free movement, to some extent, free movement of different society uh, groups also interaction exchange uh, between our people can benefit a lot into uh, into also the further development of uh, civil societies, of societies, awareness in societies of your countries. Second, I do believe that we need to address uh, through instruments we have developed here within the European Union, and those are available to many of your countries, uh, such very important issues that rule of law, fight against corruption. We have expertise, we can assist you in any way. We can, of course, provide it that uh, there is also an interest from your countries. And here, I would pass also the message that is very important, and I think that sometimes we get a little bit under uh, misunderstood. The, the one thing, we can have tools, we can have instruments, but it's actually up to your own people, societies, to push for reforms, to push for more open uh, societies, for, op for more open government. And of course, we will keep Eastern Partnership as the forum where we are discussing a variety of issues, starting from human rights, political freedoms, with all six partners. Sometimes this dialogue is not very easy, sometimes it's getting rather challenging, but we are going to continue this also uh, in the post-Riga environment. Uh, then, of course, another issue that is, I believe, also of uh, importance, uh, and I think that we still need to work more also in providing support to various non-governmental organizations. I actually want to very much echo what Commissioner Khan has said, that probably it's also time for civil society to move into politics. And then, of course, you are going to see how the life is from the different point of view. And at the same time, it is very important that also um, there is uh, more uh, people who are, through the political process, trying to influence also developments in, in your uh, home countries. Um, actually, one thing what I just want to say is that um, there have been already many speculations about what are going to be deliverables from Riga summit. We are not over yet with the drafting exercise. It's going to end only uh, tonight. So any speculations you are already hearing from anonymous sources, uh, I would a little bit uh, 
uh, this card because uh, there is no currently an issue that would, let's say, create a situation what could be described as, as kind of intrigue. We are working with all partner nations. We try to accommodate ambitions and interests of all of them. Uh, but I can say already that it is clear that Riga, or Riga summit, the declaration, will reaffirm European aspirations and European choice of those association partners that uh, are going to pursue the way towards, uh, let's say, European family. Second, uh, also there have been many speculations about the possibility of European perspective. Let me just make it clear. There are European treaties and there is Article 49 that stipulates that uh, any European nation can submit the application to the membership provided it meets all the criteria. The door remains open, but also we should understand that it's very much up to the governments, up to civil societies, up to NGOs before there is a real progress. So the door remains open, and that's also a very clear message. I invite civil societies of, of, of all three association partners to work hand in hand with the governments, to work hand in hand with broader society groups actually to make the reform process irreversible, to make your countries uh, closer to European Union and of course uh, also to work uh, towards the better future of your countries. To those countries that are still uh, in the process of either defining their own way or that are not going to join EU anytime soon, we are ready to work with you, with your civil societies, also continuing to support uh, your efforts as much as you see them fit. And finally, uh, and finally I want to underline that uh, I believe that uh, we can develop a long-term effective Eastern partnership taking into account uh, all interests and all, let's say, level of engagement, but uh, we also, and here I'm talking at the government member, should not forget that it's not only partnership for governments, it's also the partnership for societies. And that's why I do hope that in about two or and a half years, when the next summit is going to take place, we will continue also this great engagement with civil societies, broadening it to media freedom, broadening it to probably also the issues that are related to gender equality. There have been ideas also to develop that forum. So uh, we are in a long partnership, in a long way forward, and uh, hope to see you at some point soon in some other city. Thank, thank you very much. I, I think with the, the, the idea of rotating between uh, civil society and politics, I think it also should be a, a door which goes the other way as well. And I think we do sometimes see, but not enough, uh, people in senior positions in government moving into civil society. I think the interesting example also we've seen is in, in some of the partner countries is actually people who were nationals of other countries coming into government. And I think we've seen an exchange between Georgia and Ukraine, also EU member, and even US nationals serving in the Ukrainian government. So we're seeing some interesting dynamics, and I really hope that uh, those, those experiences uh, will help. And of course, Georgia has, has seen that exchange. So I'd like to ask uh, the, the State Minister from Georgia, our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me extend uh, our uh, appreciation and gratitude for the wonderfully organized uh, events alongside with the Eastern Partnership Summit that will take place tomorrow. Uh, I would like to express our gratitude to the Latvian Presidency for the really hard work and support to the Eastern Partners, to Georgia specifically, uh, when it comes to the uh, politically achievable goals when it comes to the support to the civil society that we highly appreciate. Uh, let me uh, a little bit share with you the experience that we have when it comes uh, to the cooperation and partnership that we have with the civil society in Georgia. 
uh, last year, since the signing of the association agreement and DCFTA, we have entered a new phase. Uh, this document has become the part of Georgia's internal policy. And right from the beginning, um, the civil society has become uh, the part of the implementation process. Uh, it has become the part of the preparation of the action plan and the monitoring of the implementation of it. It is an important to have the uh, non-governmental organizations as well as uh, business associ associations, trade unions involved in the process that will affect the everyday life of uh, businesses, small and medium enterprises, ordinary citizens. So we consider it uh, very important and um, uh, we, as we have the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum Georgian platform, but also um, as envisaged by the association agreement, we are in the process of forming, uh, the civil society is in the process of forming the uh, association platform. We have also encouraged other uh, players, uh, other civil society members to be part of it as the number of those who can be part of the platform is limited. So we have met two other groups that are willing and able to contribute to the process of preparation uh, and uh, as well as in the process of the monitoring. Because this is the, as our office um, coordinates the process of implementation and uh, monitors it, for us it is very important with our limited resources of up to the 40 personnel to, to have these uh, partners like uh, civil society uh, to monitor and to achieve the uh, goal of, uh, uh, of uh, implementing these uh, very important instruments and mechanisms in our country. Um, in this regard, um, uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, extended our uh, wish to have uh, the support for the civil society in Georgia by the European institutions, and we are uh, looking forward to cooperation in this regard. Uh, other than that, we have um, challenges in Georgia when it comes to the um, uh, dealing with the Russian propaganda, with the misinterpretations of the DCFTA or association agreement, when it comes uh, to the um, dismantling myths that are spread. Uh, therefore, in that regard, we are very good partners with uh, Georgian civil society. Um, when it comes to the strategic uh, communication, Georgia has, uh, has introduced the uh, strategy on information and communication, but uh, since uh, last year when, it, uh, uh, when we have initial this strategy, this year we have felt the need for strengthening this, uh, our efforts and we are preparing the um, coordinated approach together with the civil society with the diplomatic corps to address the issues that uh, may affect the uh, may affect the process of Georgia's uh, integration into the European Union. For us, it is very important to feel and, uh, and uh, on the eve of the uh, Eastern Partnership Summit, uh, we see how consolidated Georgia's civil society is. Uh, to together with the government of Georgia to to address. Uh, and express and support uh, the, the uh, concrete uh, achievables that uh, we may have uh, tomorrow after the political declaration is out. So in that regard, I would like to underline that uh, Georgian society and political parties, as we, have, we are, um, despite the political economy or military pressure from uh, our neighbor, we continue our reforms as we deliver upon uh, the uh, very important uh, mechanisms and instruments at hand uh, as uh, the societies continue to support Georgia's integration process. We are full of hope that the European Union will uh, be able to deliver on a very specific and concrete deliverables that will um, uh, and and uh, in that regard, we hope for the very uh, specific timeline that might be achievable for the Georgian citizens 
uh, for the visa way when it comes to the visa waiver. Uh, when it comes to the political support and political signal for our citizens, both residing on the both sides of the occupation line, um, against the background of the newly uh, signed uh, treaties by the Moscow with Sukhumi and with Srinwali, this is very important. Uh, as uh, we hope uh, to have the political signals for the uh, citizens of Georgia. And in that regard, uh, let me also underline and, and uh, echo the statement by the President Tusk that yes, uh, we uh, have a dream, we have the European dream, and we shall fulfill it together with the civil society, uh, and uh, we are ready to, to uh, continue to do so. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, we very much hope as um, we see the uh, increasing support uh, for the uh, process of implementation of association agreement and DCFTA in Georgia, we hope to see the increased support for the civil society that is an integral part of this process for the business associations in Georgia that are an integral part of the process when it comes to the modernization of the uh, economic, um, uh, for the modernization of the enterprises in Georgia. And uh, in general, I think this is a joint exercise that uh, we, uh, I hope, we will be successful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think one of the, the points about very often civil society is the, is the biggest supporter of European integration in the Eastern Partnership countries. And certainly since the Vilnius summit in the case of Armenia, we saw the government change course, um, whether expected or not. It surprised some, others less. Um, and is a good example of the internal and external challenges facing partner countries. So I'm very glad we have Richard um, to speak from Armenia. Richard. Thank you very much and welcome to what is the closing session. But in many ways this is not a closing session because there is no conclusion. This is a very dynamic, not a static process where Riga is representing the starting point, not the end state. In many ways the title of today's panel revitalizing the neighborhood, looking at strategy and tasks. I would argue that in terms of revitalization, look around the room, we are immensely already vital. What's needed, however, is a little more attention to strategy. And my first observation is actually looking at the difference between strategy and tactics. In many ways, strategically, the East has garnered a greater degree of only enhanced strategic significance for the European Union. In many ways, lessons learned and lessons ignored are actually important not only for the East, but for replication to the South as well. And if we look at the policy response by the European Union, there are two specific policies that reflect a more mature, prudent, and practical modification the policy of differentiation, which addresses the country-specific differences and variances. Moreover, a policy of neighbors of neighbors is also important, not only because, yes, it's about Russia, but also because it's about Turkey and Iran as well, and given the changing geopolitical reality, but also recognizing inherent opportunities. And to actually borrow a phrase from the NATO alliance, it's also about burden sharing. It's about not just the relationship between the European Union, the Eastern Partnership, and civil society, but the concept of burden sharing, where in many ways, the real agents of change, I'm sorry, are not sitting in Brussels. The real agent of change are seen in the youth in terms of civic activism, but also some of the missing element, youth in particular. What we also see from the Eastern Partnership is a need for a greater degree of embracing, empowering, and enabling civil society, because the real burden is more on us. 
in our own countries and within but between our own com countries in the Eastern Partnership. The real challenge for defining and defending the future is on our shoulders, much more than the elected officials. What we also see is bottom-up activism, is really the anchor for reform, not some top-of-the-pyramid declaration or promise of change. What we also see, though, is a reiteration of an important call for civil society to engage not just in politics, but in public policy. It is simply no longer enough to oppose. We need to propose alternative measures of reform. The second observation is a question of timing. In many ways, if we go from Vilnius to Riga, if we look at the timing, there's an important lesson from European history that it's very difficult to appreciate the historical significance of a crucial moment. And whether we recognize it or not, we are at a watershed moment in European security. We are at a turning point. The stakes could not be higher. Signs of weakness, division, and indecision are the core vulnerabilities that are being exploited by others. What we also see is, from an Armenian perspective, we have an opportunity, a second chance, an opportunity to salvage a relationship between Armenia and the European Union with important repercussions for countries like Belarus, as well as an opportunity for us to follow the lead from Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. At the same time, what we also see is we are at a historical turning point in terms of a crucial test of Western resolve and European commitment. It's a test that remains unclear whether we will pass. And in many ways, the significance geopolitically is matched by inherent vulnerabilities in terms of local politics and economics. Because at the end of the day, it's no longer sufficient to hide under the cover of the geopolitical excuse for shortcomings in reform, deficiencies in democracy. It's equally important to address local economics and politics. At the same time, we also see that economics are crucial in terms of incentive and investment. Investment in civil society, in agents of change, but also strengthening economics and local democracy to minimize vulnerability from external interference. At the same time, it's often dangerous to forget or ignore a crucial fact that decisions taken by our leaders today affect generations to come. And the decision-making process is usually well short of analysis and with far too little citizen constituencies of support. In many ways, what we see is a third final observation, where we are in terms of reassessing both the ENP as well as the Eastern Partnership. The concept or inherent contradiction between European ideals and European interests is actually still an ongoing process. First, in terms of geopolitics, it's actually interesting, in my opinion, that it's important to point out that Putin and Russia is not to blame for everything. It is too convenient and too easy to blame Putin for all of our own shortcomings, mistakes in policy, and deficiencies domestically. It is also, in many ways, Russia is, in terms of its impact on the Eastern Partnership, operating from a position of defensive weakness, not confident strength. In many ways, the European model is one based on attraction, seduction, not coercion and pressure, as demonstrated by the alternative from Russia. But in many ways, if Putin is not to blame for all of our problems, and we must be honest, the EU is neither the answer nor the solution to all our problems either. The Eastern Partnership is an important tool, instrument, and opportunity, but the real burden is again on us within our own societies and countries. And in many ways, despite the high level of this panel, 
we need to also remind even our elected officials, even our own leaders, the need for greater accountability. Accountability for decisions taken today affecting generations to come, but also accountability in terms of learning our own lessons of what went wrong with the Eastern Partnership. From the Armenian context, one clear mistake was we did a very poor job in terms of a communication strategy. We didn't do enough to define and defend European values and to explain what are the concrete benefits from the association agreement for the ordinary citizen, the ordinary consumer. We need to deepen and broaden constituencies in favor of deepening ties with the EU and the association agreements, but we need a better job at our own communication strategy. And in this context, civil society has an important obligation and a responsibility in accountability as well. And finally, it's most important to note that in conclusion, there is no conclusion. This is and remains a dynamic, ongoing work in progress. And thank you to the Latvian presidency and most importantly to the Latvian organizers because today's event may be on the margins of the summit, but it is by no means marginal. Thank you. Thanks very much to, to all the panelists. I think after, after Vilnius, there was talk of the road to Riga. I think it would actually be the road to Malta from here. Um, but uh, may, maybe it won't be exactly two years, the, the next summit. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions now. Maybe we'll take four or five questions, and then we'll come back to the panelists, and I hope we'll be able to have a, another round. And we'll start with uh, Dimitro Shoga. There should be some wireless microphones around. Is there anybody? Yep, there's, there's one coming. Thank you. Uh, dear dist distinguished guests, uh, dear participants of this conference, dear friends, uh, let me announce uh, on behalf of uh, civil society representatives of Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia gathered at this conference that we are now symbolically submitting applications from Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova to become members of the European Union. Uh, let me... Let me stress that we are fully aware that there are a lot of difficulties in meeting the criteria associated with the membership in the Union. But our nations have paid a huge price for our European choice, and we firmly believe that we will be able to overcome all the obstacles on the road to join the European family. Uh, with, this symbolic move, with this symbolic move, we call for uh, historic responsibility and strategic vision to guide, to shape the political will of the European leaders to uh, send us the message, to send to the societies of our countries the message that we are welcomed in the European Union, in the European family of nations. And uh, we call also for the support of, from the part of the European societies. Uh, we call for solidarity with our countries and we are thankful for uh, all the, all the uh, participants of the conference who left their signatures in support of our applications during the last uh, break, uh, coffee break before, before this panel. So now, uh, please, the representatives of the civil society of uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, handing over application letters to Commissioner Khan, whom we kindly ask to pass over to share them with the participants of the summit. Thank you. We, sh we should say that at the, the, the Vilnius summit, there was a civil society initiative to sign the association agreement for Ukraine, and it happened, so we'll see. The uh, representatives of many, many countries supported this symbol symbolic act. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a very lively demonstration of uh, the um, capacity of a strong civil society. Uh, if you allow me, I will take these posters with me because I I am lacking uh, pictures and posters in my meeting room, so I will take it with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, but officially, the presidency would be the addressee for this. Uh, but we have a very close and uh, friendly cooperation. And I think uh, we understand personally this also as an obligation to work on the European perspective of your countries. And uh, thanks a lot. Uh, but uh, once again, we all have the obligation to contribute to this perspective. And uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I personally feel responsible and will use the remaining time of my office should be four and a half years to work on this. Thank you very much. Um, does, it, does it work? No. And, and let me just uh, really say that Commissioner Hahn is doing his best since the very first day taking the office of the Commissioner for EU Enlargement and Neighborhood Policy to really provide assistance which is very practical and which actually really contributes to, to the reform process. So uh, we will take the joint responsibility as the presidency, which still has only one month to go, and the commissioner who has four and a half years to go. But you will stay on my side. Uh, always. <laughs> OK, let, let's take some, some more questions. I saw um, Boris, Stefan, and then just behind. So, and here. Thank you, Boris Navasadian, the Yerevan Press Club. Um, I was very much uh, um, impressed with what happened recently, and my signature is also there. But my question goes to Mr. Bakradze. Uh, you mentioned that uh, civil society in Georgia is very much consolidated, but of course we know that uh, there is some strata among civil society that is uh, choosing other priorities than Europeanization. Um, I'm sure it is a smaller segment than in Armenia, but still it exists. Uh, do you mean that they uh, represent minor threat or, and can't be just ignored, or you do not see themselves, themselves at all? Thanks. We'll take the questions and then come back to the panel. Uh, step on. Stepan Grigorian, yeah, is Armenia. I'm from Armenia. Well, of course, this initiative of our friends from Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova is an excellent one. We all support them, although, unfortunately, we in Armenia went to the uh, Eurasian Union. I also thank uh, Latvian diplomats and organizers of this conference because it was an extraordinary forum. Thank you. Now I would like to discuss two issues that worry us very much. I talked to many delegates, so I'd like to bring these two issues to your attention. The first one is of a new appearance in the Soviet, post-Soviet territory of the political hostages. You know that some citizens of Ukraine have been abducted from the territory of Ukraine and are currently the political 
hostages. As far as I know, in the final document of this conference, this idea did not get into this document, but I think that it would be very correct to include this information in this document because this is a new phenomenon. They are not political prisoners, but they are political hostages. So my suggestion is to add the formulation that we condemn when citizens of the Eastern Partnership, including Nadezhda Savchenko, are, have been abducted and are being uh, appear in court abroad. And the second idea is that sometimes you speak equally about uh, our countries while they are very different because Armenia was together with Belarus. Please take into account that even though the situation in Armenia is very difficult, it is not equal to the one in Belarus. Yep. And then here. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations uh, uh, to the Ukrainian friends. Uh, I'm uh, Razin Rulayev, uh, come from Azerbaijan and represent Region International Analytical Center. Um, fortunately, uh, Ukraine and Georgia could have managed overcoming the Russian phobia and signed the association agreement, therefore, uh, whereas uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia are still at the crossroads. Uh, my concern uh, rises from the uh, Azerbaijan's perspective of signing the association agreement. Uh, yesterday, um, as you know, the President Ilham Aliyev uh, did not come to the summit, but uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs is here, and he already submitted the strategic partnership agreement to the EU. And uh, my uh, question is, what's going uh, to happen with the strategic agreement? Um, but why I'm concerned, uh, the decision takes too long, and... Uh, the geopolitics um, in the region uh, may change the situation and Azerbaijan um, can uh, maybe change its also again decision and uh, decline also the strategic partnership. But uh, there should be no other way than your integration for Azerbaijan. And I think that the whole Azerbaijani people and the whole civil society is for Azerbaijan's Euro integration. But, uh, but uh, apart from this, uh, uh, other reasons that are subjective, there are also objective reasons as a, a threat from uh, north that comes from Russia. Uh, once in Azerbaijan, uh, in the meeting with the European ambassadors, there was a question uh, to, um, to the ambassadors. Uh, what's, um, uh, the one ambassador said, uh, European ambassador said, uh, Azerbaijan should sign the association agreement, otherwise the Brussels has a patience, so the patience may come to an end. And there was a question, what's going to happen uh, when the patience is over? Uh, uh, she said, uh, Brussels uh, will decide. And now, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Commissioner Johannes represents uh, Brussels. And now I would uh, put up a question, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's going to happen when your patience is over? Because it... Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the process takes too long and uh, uh, there is no decision for uh, association agreement and uh, on the Azerbaijan's proposal on the strategic partnership on, uh, on bilateral level. Um, but, but just uh, one last point, um, uh, uh, why I'm very much concerned, again, I would like to reiterate, uh, but the, the European Union uh, took too long to decide on Nabucco project and then Azerbaijan could, uh, did, uh, did unilaterally decided to go with TANAP and TOP project. So Nabucco project was a fiasco. So the, the same, uh, that, that, the, uh, that was the end of the Azerbaijani patients when it unilaterally decided to go on its, on its own. So uh, that is the question. Uh, what is the Azerbaijan's perspective and what do you uh, expect uh, from uh, today from uh, uh, from today, what's going to happen to the Azerbaijani perspective on as association agreement and otherwise the, uh, the one that Azerbaijan submitted uh, on, uh, on bilateral strategic partnership with the EU. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There's, there's three more hands and then we'll go to the panelists. 
Gia, then there's one here, and Larissa. Okay, okay we just witness a very impressive and moving, I would say, ceremony. I hope it will also prove historical, as Jeff uh, mentioned. And after this, after this, it's a little bit uh, almost impolite to ask provocative questions uh, to panelists, but I will still um, address a question to Commissioner Hahn and Minister Rinkevich. Uh, Mr. Minister, you just said that the uh, kind of door of European Union is open. It's up to us to make uh, applications not only from civil society and most importantly to reform our countries. And I cannot agree more with the last uh, point. Uh, as a think tank and professor of uh, politics in Georgia, I can attest that neither quality of our political institutions nor level of democratic uh, economic sorry, development would allow, would be sufficient for us becoming <laughs> members of European Union tomorrow. But this is not what is being discussed. What is being discussed is some kind of recognition, not of our right to dream, which is a wonderful right, of course. We exercise it a lot in Georgia in particular, you know that. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, actually recognition of uh, what is called European perspective, which means very general and maybe even vague uh, recognition that if we uh, do reform ourselves sufficiently, uh, you know, membership is actually on, maybe on the table, and that kind of recognition will provide an additional impetus for that process of reform as such. Uh, so, uh, and uh, perception, not just in Georgia, I would be univer say universally, is not that the reason for denial of such uh, recognition of perspective is uh, not uh, in uh, insufficient uh, level of readiness or commitment from our countries, but more about uh, geopolitical anxieties uh, in uh, Europe per se, and uh, to say simply in uh, some kind of uh, wish to placate or appease uh, Russia, basically. So can you somehow dispel uh, this uh, perception or wish I mean, we being a mature people, we should accept realities that Copenhagen criteria are wonderful, but real politics uh, should take precedence sometimes. Thanks. There was one hand just behind, and then we'll come to the, to the front, the two questions at the front. Uh, I uh, uh, agree to the previous speaker who spoke about uh, political hostages. I also would like to suggest that we should include also to free civilian hostages. Uh, but, but because we have an occupied territory of Azerbaijan, we have uh, 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 Assad, of Mr. Assad, of he is a civilian hostage. Uh, so that's I am calling the, that this, those two hostages uh, should be freed. They wanted to see the graves of their relatives, but now they were detained and there was a trial and nobody uh, acknowledged the sentences. And I repeat that everything was done which uh, has been occupied by rebels. Question here, so for the microphone over here, thanks. Deutsche Welle, Roman Goncharenko, Germany. Um, I have two questions for the Commissioner Hahn and uh, for the um, Foreign Minister Rinkevich, if I may. The first one is um, the Ukrainian President, uh, Mr. Poroshenko, and his Foreign Minister, Mr. Klimkin, said over and over again that they expect uh, for Ukraine to become a um, uh, written statement in the, in the final declaration that the Ukraine will become a EU member someday. They also expected uh, visa liberalization to be put on paper for Ukraine. This is not going to happen. This is what the German Chancellor Angela Merkel said today very clearly. So the question to you is, do you think Ukraine pushed too hard? Was it a mistake? And the second question is, um, we are here at a conference uh, of civil society and there is one new conference taking place. Um, it's a media conference. 
Um, but do you think uh, that there is time for a security conference in the Eastern Partnership? Because three countries of six face severe secu security challenges. I mean Ukraine, I mean Georgia and Moldova. Ukraine sees itself in war with Russia, Georgia had a war with Russia, Moldova could be next, or some people say. So do you think it's, what do you think of an idea to hold an Eastern Partnership security conference? Thank you. Okay, the final question, Larissa, yeah. here. Thank you very much, uh, and I want to start with congratulation of Georgian, Ukrainian, and Moldovan uh, societies with submission of their application. Well done, and thank you for putting it the, uh, my question, or rather urge into such a context. Um, recent EBRD's um, uh, research showed that 75% of Armenian people uh, look at uh, Europe as the model of democracy worth pursuing and need to be pursued. And I have to say since September 3, 2013, the number of people as per research supporting European aspiration or looking at Europe more favorably has increased. Uh, this is in the context of decreasing, depleting democracy and economy. Um, so, uh, and um, um, the, the, the fact of increasing support to civil society, as um, uh, Commissioner Han uh, mentioned, is extremely uh, important and extremely favorable, but it's not only the financial support that uh, makes the trick. As Richard said, uh, the responsibility and burden is on us, on Armenian people, and to support and harness the energy of the 75% of Armenian people, uh, they need the deliverable that they're looking from Europe. And that's not the money, that's not, uh, that's the justice and democracy. So, um, and again, coming back to what Richard said, urging on the lessons learned and lessons not learned, um, our understanding as of civil society that the best support would be supporting of the causes of the transformation and uh, making the transformation a paramount of that engagement with Armenia. So uh, had that been exploited and uh, peddled uh, sufficiently again is our understanding, the U-turn of accountable governance wouldn't have been such a uh, uh, easy task, and the support of Armenian people would, of the 75% would have been much more vocal and instrumental. So how are we, hopefully in the new engagement with uh, Armenia, um, how the European Union is prepared to uh, better instrumentalize that, uh, that change, which we believe is exactly in favor of not only our societal uh, development, but also European unions of, to guarantee itself from, uh, from uh, uh, potential uh, unaccountable governance in future. Thank you very much. So we, we, we will start with, with Commissioner Hahn. Yeah, thank you very much, and once again, thank you for, for all these contributions and actions. Um, once again, um, asking for patience, or if, if, if patients are losing, I think if you enter politics, you have to be patient and you have to be determined and a little bit uh, stubborn. Uh, and to a certain extent, also a little bit, you, you should uh, keep your naivety, because if, if you lose naivety, you lose the capacity to believe on changes. And um, that's what I'm always telling my people, not only in politics, but also when I was in, in, in business, we have to keep a little bit of naivety in order to change things. Because all of us know why certain things are as they are and why it is not possible to change it. If this would be our final assessment, there's never a chance to change things. So we have to believe on something, we have to use an opportunity, we have to see if there is a little um, um, open door and then we have to use it and to go uh, through the open door and uh, try to change things. So this is why we should never lose our patience, 
We will never lose our patience. We have to be determined, and this is what I can reassure you in any case, personally, but I believe also on behalf of European Union. But I think it's also important, and, and this is something where we have all together hopefully learned our lessons, um, that we have to look for pragmatic solutions. Uh, we have to see what is possible, what is feasible, and uh, we should not overstretch any of us, any of our partners. We have to be realistic, but once again ambitious and uh, determined. And uh, I think it's important, and this will be always stressed, and sometimes it's not, uh, uh, not everybody is happy to hear it, but it's about sovereignty of countries, sovereign choices of the people, and this is not only a European obsession, this is international law. This is a law which applies worldwide. And we Europeans try to put it through and to respect it. And we fight for it. And we will never give up on that. So it's about the sovereign, sovereignty of a country and the sovereign choices of people. And uh, what you have done today was your sever sovereign choice and uh, by signing it and, and, and things like that. And as it was already said by the minister, there is this famous and important Article 49, and along this, everything is possible uh, if, if uh, the conditions of the article are met. And as it is within the European Treaty, we are, um, um, so to say, uh, responsible to respect it, and we will respect it, and we will we'll leave it. But also here, once again, it's important to focus what many of you have said today on the necessary reforms. Of course, it's important to have visions. And in that respect, uh, I share some of the words and actions of representatives of our partner countries. They have to push, of course, but they also have to push in their country itself. Uh, both is necessary. And when President Poroshenko said a couple of months ago uh, his vision is to submit once a membership application, and he was talking about 2020 because he knows that necessary reforms are, uh, reforms are necessary before he can submit an application, and he was talking about 40 to 60 reforms. A lot has to be done. And I think this is what is important to underline. We should all be determined to a European perspective. We should be clear about the road to it. And we have to work to path, uh, to pave the way towards this European perspective. And this is what we should now focus in the next couple of months and years, that we make progress on that. And the fact that uh, we could sign this uh, association agreement the TCFTA, this is also, as I said today in another, in another meeting, a gigantic fitness program for your country to make it ready for European membership. So to comply with um, the requirements agreed in these uh, agreements is a precondition, but it's not only something per se, it helps your, in particular, business community to accommodate, to approximate to European standards. And in many cases, European standards are worldwide standards. So it offers export opportunities. And if, if it offers export opportunities, uh, it gives a boost to the economy. And if there's a boost to the economy, it creates jobs. And if it creates jobs, it creates welfare. And this is what we are working on a su success story of all our partner countries, which is the best proof for any kind of uh, European inspiration. And once again, it's about peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. And the founding idea of the European Union was, and it's still the case, by increasing economic ties, by strengthening economic ties, having a guarantee that there is peace, stability, and prosperity. And it worked out within the European Union. 
and it will work out also with our partners and maybe some of our partners could become members of the family in the future. Well, um, first of all, uh, I want to address the, the question uh, of our Georgian friend about the right to dream and uh, the, the current situation. Look, I'm coming from the countries that roughly 20 years ago started the both European and Euro-Atlantic integration. I was quite young Secretary of State at the Ministry of Defense back in 1997 when I was told by many people, well, EU may be sometimes in the future, NATO never. Uh, forget it. Forget about the dreaming. Forget about the working. There are uh, legitimate interests of third parties and so on and so on and so on. Uh, some narrative we are hearing, of course, also today from many uh, politicians, from, from, from academicians, from also uh, journalists uh, writing their columns and so on in, in different countries. Uh, let me say this. First of all, uh, of course we were at that time in a totally different environment. Of course the mood was also a bit probably optimistic after the end of Cold War, after the collapse of Soviet Union. But we were told also just calm down. What we decided as a strategy and I think that we still owe the great credit to uh, presidents, prime ministers, ministers of Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, is that we decided to push and to show that we can implement very painful sometimes, uh, very necessary uh, reforms and to show that we really want to become the part of European family. I believe that currently the road is first of all to do your best, those who have signed association agreements, to go that way, to implement reforms, and those are going to be very difficult. Economic, social, political reforms, judicial reforms can deprive popularity from many governments, even many succeeding governments, but at the same time show that you can deliver, show that you can meet the criteria. That's one. Second, uh, while there is not the European perspective here in Riga, that's that's a fact, because we also need the agreement of all 28 European Union members, and that's another fact. And you may imagine that in this boiling world we have, with southern uh, neighborhood, with migration, with terrorism, with <coughs> ISIS, with the situation in Libya, with uh, also internal challenges we are facing right now within the EU, like there is going also to be some ongoing talks uh, uh, around the summit about uh, how we are going to deal further with the Greek uh, loan program, the United Kingdom will be present their options to some of European leaders and so on. Still, I believe that uh, first of all, what is important for Riga summit is a very strong reaffirmation of already that has been reached and also this, the fact what I said that uh, there is nothing in the declaration that says, no, you are not going to, let's say, or you are deprived from, from, from this uh, opportunity. Article 49 is there, but let's face it, there is also a very long way for all those who want to become EU members, and there is also, let's admit it, a long way to work within the European Union. But we should do that, and we need, to some extent, also, not only patience, that's a good thing, but also very active work, very active proof from your societies that you are, as sometimes Americans are putting in their Amer Senate hearings, are they like us? And your answer should be, yes, we are. And then it's very difficult, actually, to say that, no, you are not part of the family and you cannot become part of family. That's about this issue. On the question from our Azeri friend uh, about the strategic partnership agreement, uh, well, first of all, I want to say that uh, how that we are very sorry for the tragedies that happened a couple of days in Baku, and I know that there has been a phone conversation between the Latvian president and the Azeri president. The president of Azerbaijan uh, also had a phone conversation with the president of European Council, and he expressed and explained why 
uh, President Aliyev cannot, uh, cannot at this time attend Riga. But on the agreement, I believe that we are ready uh, to work, and I know that uh, there is already the draft uh, submitted to the to, to Commissioner, yes. Uh, so we are ready to, 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 work, uh, to work with you and to find the way how to, uh, let's say, materialize in the legal, political form the individual relationship within the Eastern Partnership between EU and Azerbaijan. Of course, we should also understand we are 28, then we have European Parliament, then we have European Commission, and then we have the Council. And unfortunately, that system doesn't work like in a national government sometimes just like that. But I believe that we can actually find through this agreement also the individual uh, partnership uh, within, as I said, the broader partnership framework. On, uh, on uh, the question from, from journalist of Deutsche Welle, uh, I, had, I had seen a very short report from the Chancellor's uh, speech in the Bundestag. So I would be very careful because I usually uh, like to read the full statements, uh, not uh, a kind of excerpt. But uh, let me just reiterate a couple of points. I think that uh, definitely we should understand that Eastern Partnership per se has six uh, members or six partners with different level of ambition. Uh, it's up to Belarus, Azerbaijan, for instance, or Armenia to decide uh, what's their way forward. So it doesn't mean really that being Eastern Partner, you automatically are also, you know, candidate for membership. The membership perspective, the membership uh, process is totally different instrument that operates under totally different rules. What I believe we really need to concentrate right now, keeping in mind Article 49, keeping in mind uh, all those things, how better assist those association partners that want to implement reforms that makes them much closer in practice. But I cannot right now say that, uh, and I stressed it in my opening remarks, I cannot say that right now we have a situation where uh, we are rejecting. And I believe also that was not in the Chancellor's statement. She was simply referring to the fact which is obvious, that partnership doesn't mean automatic membership, which is absolutely correct. But at the same time, uh, I also believe, and of course I, as a presidency, has to keep also all 28 member states when the drafting exercise comes into, into some also uh, harmony of, of opinion. I also believe that uh, we should understand also aspirations and European choice. We should find the way how to assist the current uh, countries of association agreements or association partners in their reform process. And let's never say never to anything, because there are sometimes so changing environment. 30 years ago, nobody would dream that the Baltic states would become NATO or EU members. It happened. So let's, let's keep, uh, keep this and let's not get too negative also. On the visa liberalization, I just want to stress that there is the agreed language so far as I know, at least on that part, that uh, I also referred to. Uh, yes, there is not going to be signing of a visa liberalization program in Riga. Like there was not signing of association agreements in Vilnius. They were signed later. That's exactly, I believe, is going to happen also with visa liberalization for Ukraine and Georgia. As soon as they meet all criteria as set in uh, Commission's report, as soon as Commission reval, uh, reviews the progress, and that's going to happen by the end of this year, I believe there is a very, very good chance, criteria met, that they get visa liberalization. So this is the positive news coming out. Uh, on the security conference, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, I want to also recognize those partners uh, like Georgia, like Moldova, who are also now active members of CSDP. They are going to send or their soldiers are going to be part of EU missions in, in some of our missions. Whether we need also the kind of security forum of Eastern Partnership, I leave this question open. That's something that probably we can really discuss with, uh, with countries whether they see the need to have that. And that initiative probably should come 
first of all, from the Eastern partners. But let me also say that we have so many uh, security forums or conferences uh, throughout the year. We have, for instance, Riga conference here. We always discuss uh, the issues uh, that are related to the security concerns of, of our Eastern partners. But uh, I think that uh, this is not a bad idea, but also then uh, we have to understand uh, whether that's going to be another nice exchange of, of uh, think tanks or there is something more. So I, I think that this is something that probably we can explore, but I leave this a bit open. My final point, I know that I talk too long uh, on the question about um, the 75% uh, uh, Armenians uh, supporting uh, and, and uh, willing to be a kind of uh, Europeans and, and, and live with the, within the European Union values. Uh, look, uh, I want to say that uh, we also are discussing with Armenia and we had a very good association council, uh, sorry, cooperation council with Armenia in January also the possibility of uh, concluding the new agreement, taking into account the sovereign right and the decision of Armenia to become the part of Eurasian Economic Union. That's, that's the choice of the government of Armenia. That's a choice that I understand was also endorsed by the parliament. And uh, that's what uh, we are respecting. And we are not, let's say, uh, pressuring uh, anyone to, 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 to become part of association agreement or or to become part of EU, as you know. So I very much leave it to internal Armenian political process to decide what's the future of your country. We stand ready and we have funds and we have uh, also instruments uh, on, in, to, to support uh, rule of law programs, NGOs, and I think that we are also quite actively using them, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, but this is really the issue that is very much in the hands of you and, 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 and your public uh, how to proceed. The only thing what I want to say here is that uh, while, uh, while we sometimes expect, and I'm also feeling here a little bit the question, what the EU is going to provide, offer, or do? Uh, I can say in one word, we can assist you in many ways, but the homeworks to make, are yours and we cannot do homework for you. We can only assist, but those are your decisions, your choices, and uh, also uh, your success. But we have a lot of instruments also uh, to support your governments, civil societies, uh, as, as much as you are ready to take that support. Sorry. Uh, thank you. To, to answer the, the question of my mean, colleague uh, Boris, uh, yes, there are the um, uh, non-governmental organizations uh, supporting the Eurasian Union, uh, but they are not very much keen to cooperate with our office, understandably. But uh, it's not that um, about the number. You know, the tendency, unfortunately, for the last uh, couple of years, what the polls show, is uh, a little bit increasing uh, in support for that and uh, that's why I think that uh, our approach should be consolidated together with the civil society to the, with the European Union institutions as, as uh, Minister Rinkevich has un uh, underlined this is a very demanding process when we uh, implement the association agreement, the CFTA. Therefore, support and assistance in that regard is very important. Uh, support when we talk about the strategic communication with our society is very important, and there we feel the uh, active um, yeah, engagement of the, by the civil society as well. So um, generally, there might be uh, some tendencies, but uh, as we continue the process, as we already get uh, the feedback and uh, positive uh, results from the process that we are in when it comes to the um, democratization, when it comes to the freedom of media, when it comes to the uh, reforms in the judiciary, in the penitentiary, etc., when it comes to the results of the 21% increase of the export uh, since the start of the DCFTA to the European Union, I think this is the process that will, will uh, bring its uh, positive results and affect this tendency as well. Thank you. 
I do want to jump in and add a note of optimism. Uh, because to be honest, I think one mistake we make here together is to underestimate our own power, the power of new ideas and the power of bottom-up civic activism is actually the key to lasting change in every country, in every region. Personally, I moved to Armenia nine years ago. Unlike many in Armenia, I chose to come to the Eastern neighborhood. I chose voluntarily to move here from the United States. It's also because it's too big to fail. In many ways, the momentum is on our side. There's no alternative but reform, and the days of the autocrats, the authoritarians, are in sunset. They are much weaker than many understand, and actually their days are numbered. And I do want to close on a more positive note as well. But the real power for change lies in our own hands, with youth, education, and actually civil society. That, and only that, is the key to lasting change. And in many ways, time is on our side. Thank, thanks very much. I, th I think we should also remember, I mean, as we said in, in Vilnius, we had the civil society assigning the association agreement for Ukraine. And whether it's naivety, idealism, or just trying to push the agenda, it does make a difference. And the association agreement is very much in line with the acquis communautaire. So it, is a, it is, can, can be seen, without being explicitly stated, as a first step towards European membership, at least perspective. Um, and I think the security issue is something which is so important now. Um, it doesn't mean that Eastern Partnership is going to be the framework, but certainly because of the linkages, the platform on common security and defense policy now within Working Group 1, there is there a linkage. But clearly, I think it's individual EU member states, perhaps in training, building up security policy for, with partners, part, Eastern Partnership countries. There's a lot of work to do. And I know you all have a long night ahead to get the declaration finished. Um, I have final two announcements. Christoph, do you have an announcement? Yeah, and just the other one, while Christoph gets a microphone, is lunch is in the restaurant. So thank you again to the organizers. Um, I think it's been very well organized, and to the interpreters as well. Christoph. Can I, can I just say we can't leave the heads of state alone tomorrow at the summit. So uh, we're going off at 7.30 in the morning to show the, our support for their European aspirations. Uh, we, will be out, we will be going to the outside the building and to just show that we are there, we are with them, and we want to help them in their deliberations. So invitation to anyone who wants to be up at 7.30 to go and demonstrate outside the, the summit venue, please come. Thank you.